On this podcast, we'll discuss how laughter is the sound of the soul. We'll tackle it by addressing specific things like laughter and its contagious benefits, comedy and spirituality beautifully intertwined, how words can become roadblocks, choosing a spiritual language that connects us to other faiths instead of creating disconnection, how love is many things, laughter included, and how surrendering to the anxiety of life allows you to find deep joy inside the uncertainty of it all. Think about it. We all profess that we do everything in our power to sidestep the holes on our path that have that real potential of tripping us up real good. Why then do we find ourselves wondering why our lives reveal that we take certain aspects of our life way too seriously? For example, consider things like faith and spiritual connection with life. Welcome to Weekly Wins and Losses. My name is James Hepner, former real estate entrepreneur turned self-development hacker, coach, and fulfillment strategist. Each week, we bring you a thought to wrestle with that will help you live fully alive and gain more life. Real life is made up of both wins and losses. Both were designed for your good. That's basic reality. Without facing and learning how to embrace your losses for greater gain, you miss out. You leave 50% of your life experience on the table. So with that, let's begin the show. With inflation rates rising, interest rates shooting up, gas prices skyrocketing, and the continued global unrest, it's easy to find what's wrong in the world. Tony Robbins says, what's wrong in the world is always available, but so is what's right. Instead of trying to hope and wish the world into a better place, it's time to make the most important decision any of us can ever make, and that is to invest in yourself. Now, you know I've always stood with you as you've navigated the uncertainties of life's reality. However, it's now time that I step up and take decisive action to walk alongside your current life journey in a new way, and that is by making myself available to you in a radical, new way during these challenging times. So for a limited time, I'm inviting you to a 45 minute strategic business life consultation. No charge and no strings attached. This consultation is where you'll regain the reins of your life. It's where you'll gain clarity on exactly why you're stuck, moving you directly towards your optimal outcomes. And I'll be honest, and I'm humbled to say, however, my client's generous reflection of their time spent with me reveals the truth. The skills they've been able to master in such a short period of time by engaging in our one-on-one strategic sessions have changed their lives in so many ways. This is the only invitation that I can fathom that will put my skin in the game of your life in such a way that will allow us, you and I, to address your specific needs with precision and excellence. 45 minutes, just you and I, together on one call to get you headed in the direction you crave most. Here's what my clients report after one-on-one sessions with me. A decrease in indecision. A increase in clarity, confidence, and courage. An increase to fully capitalize on what's directly before them. An increase in the impact that they crave to have at work, on their families, and inside their communities. A decrease in pain and suffering. A decrease in anxiety. So, if you want to move beyond old stories, get clear in where you're headed so that you can shake your world, then here's a rich opportunity for you today. One-on-one strategic business life consultation with me. One-on-one 45 minutes. So, if you want to maximize this opportunity, if you want to reclaim and regain your inner power, then you're going to want to slow things down during these challenging times. And how? Well, engaging and getting right with your life and making a life plan. I should let you know that this offer will fill up and expire. Click in the show notes to get your 45-minute strategic business life consultation. No charge, no strings attached. May this episode change your everyday life. Welcome, friends. Today we have on the show a friend of mine, Newer Kid Y. He's got a podcast 
God, yay or nay. Nuar, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, buddy. Dude, you and I, two bros getting together again. We did this on your show a little while ago. And uh, I just resonated with with you. Uh, and I think partly why is uh, Nuar, folks, he's a comedian and he's based out of Toronto. He travels throughout North America and the UK, putting on these little, uh, you know, laughing festivals for people, basically. <laughs> it's down to com- comedy. And some of you may have uh, heard him on Sirius XM or maybe even CBC. But uh, Nuar, um, yeah, I'm just excited to unpack, you know, the podcast you have, God, yay or nay, and how that blends with comedy. Take take us into, take us back. Uh, what is it about you that says, God, yay or nay, and then you have this comedic approach to life. Talk to us, how was this birthed? <laughs> All right, well, that's a big question. <laughs> um, <laughs> Honestly, like I've been doing uh, stand up and like improv and stuff like that since I was 18. I'm now 35. So it's it's been in my blood, like doing comedy. I guess I've always been kind of like not don't take life too serious and like try to have fun in life and always laugh and always smile. And like I, I think everyone always like if they know me, they always see hey, I'm smiling or laughing and stuff like that. But yeah, man, I don't know. I, I was like. Once I got into university, maybe about 1920, I was always into like kind of Eastern philosophy. I, I, in my head, I always thought like there's something with the mind that's just greater. Like it, it, it like the mind's powerful. It can help us like become what we want. Like I've always believed that. And like even when I first saw that movie, The Secret, like, uh, like I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not big into that movie anymore. But back then, when I like saw that, I was like 18, and I was like, yeah, this is exactly what I want. And you know, and like I'm like, yeah, your mind is a superpower or something like that. And like I don't believe that anymore. But like. But it, like that kind of stuff always resonated with me. So I got into meditation. I got into yoga. Uh, I, like later on in life, I got into a little bit of psychedelics and stuff. And like, you know, my my mindset kind of went from like when I was in university being kind of very like atheistic, kind of like mm-hmm. scientific because that's I was in sciences and stuff. And then like when I got into all of these, I became very like kind of spiritual, believing in something more, believing in something bigger. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and then eventually like just getting into comedy and stuff like using those like kind of spiritual disciplines to kind of calm myself down, to go on stage to open up my mind so I can write about different subjects and uh yeah like using that like really helped me and I could see like how this really can improve a person and then yeah I have like those were just things I always was interested in and then eventually it was like I got to make a podcast on this like this is just stuff I'm constantly interested I'm constantly reading about I'm talking about and yeah I was like I want to make a podcast so I can just talk to people like yourself and like actually just like really learn more about this. And yeah, they did like, that's pretty much where it kind of started and where it is now. I love that. I know when you and I uh, uh, were pitching and catching on your show just uh, a few days or a week ago or so, one of the things that, um, and you you're asking questions and I was just sharing with you, on the concept of God, yay or nay. Often in society, we feel like we have to make a decision, yes or no. And it isn't like, well, um, there's a mystery and I can't give a definitive. And I like your podcast name, yay or nay. That's how we feel in life. We're like, well, we should should make an absolute. And I shared with you a bit of a story how sometimes in life, it seems like God or this, this, this force of nature is with us. And all of a sudden it seems gone. We're like, wait a minute. I was just, let's say, in trouble. And now it seems like some force, there's grace, there's love, something comes along. And I wouldn't say it rescues us, but it just sits beside us and it helps us bear the burden and helps us do life a little differently. And then all of a sudden, just like that, we're like, God, where are you? And it seems gone. <laughs> you know, so it's like to wrestle with the mystery, which, by the way, I want to just tune this up brother you got the best laugh in the world i kid you not when i hear your laugh it's just legit <laughs> it's the best oh thanks it makes, man. it makes me laugh it's so original i've never heard it it's just so fun i think it's just yeah so no that's 
that's the Alberta in me. Uh, that's like, <laughs> I grew up in uh, Calgary and uh, and then was raised in like a small farming town called High River. So I think that's where a lot of my ha- like everyone says I have a hick laugh. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I don't feel that. To me, it's actually. It's funny you say this, right? So every time I hear you laugh and not to pick at or probe at it, like, please laugh as much as you can, (laughs) you know, but one of the things that I love about it is it just genuinely has me curious about who you are as an individual. So it isn't like where I think you're from the farm. And by the way, I I was raised in the farm too. So perhaps I resonate with you. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) There you go. And, uh, but anyway, so to, to tune it back to uh, laughter and spirituality. It seems like so often we as society, we get caught in the weeds of being so serious about something. And then we miss the gift. The gift is right there. The aliveness. Instead of us thinking that we have to know it all and we have to understand it all. It's that mystery, yay or nay. I love it. So when you think about your work, your work, not only on the podcast, but when you think about when you're traveling, when you're in the UK, when you're going on live and you're, you know, you're doing the set, how has laughter really opened you up to exploring and going deeper and getting nearer to universal truths? Not perspective truths, but universal truths. So higher truths that we can all, for example, agree, for example, that love is what we run on. So mm-hmm. how has laughter served you there? Mm, yeah that's a good question um like I, I think when you when you're laughing though like well, I don't know what's that saying like laughter is the sound of the soul or something like that but like mm-hmm. when you're laughing like you're very pure in the moment you're like there's no like tension or something in your body you're just letting everything go and just being and I think any kind of spirituality is just about being like um mm-hmm. you like yeah like you said like our minds like when you said yay or nay like our minds always want to like um make everything a duality like good or bad like we want to look at the situation and be like this is good or bad or because like we our minds want to control our minds want to be like we know what the situation is and we have control over it but like the whole uh, essence of spirituality is to just let go of that And like laughter lets allows you to let go. When you laugh, you're just like, okay, you're just being there. Like I that's like the best thing about comedy for me is like when I really kill a show and I'm just doing so well, you can just feel the audience just completely let go and just lose themselves in laughter. And that in itself is kind of like a spiritual, like it's a smaller spiritual moment, but you know, you can tell they come up, come to you after the show and you can tell they have this relief in them and they're just like, hey, you let me like really release some tension and just be. And then like, that's all it is. Like that spirituality is just be. Like, like you said, like yay or nay, good or bad. Like our minds are about duality because they want to, our minds want to feel like they have control. Even if they know, like, you know, deep down, you have no control, but if you could label stuff like as good or bad or yay or nay or any kind of duality, um, it, it feels good in your, in your ego just to be like, oh, I have control, but that's not right. You don't have control. And like a lot of spirituality is understanding that you don't have control and getting a little bit of comfort in that understanding and just being like, Hey, I have no control. Um, life is uncertain i don't know what's going to happen in the future there's uncertainty but like developing that un, uh, de- developing that comfort in that uncertainty mm-hmm. really allows you to just be and like when you can just be then that's when like a lot of uh who you really are starts to shine and like i tried like the last decade of my life is trying to develop that on stage too because when you're on stage now you have a whole other thing about like having an audience in front of you that you have to entertain and you're getting paid and you have a manager that's like do better fucking do well (laughs) or you know you have all these like conflicting stuff so like I have to find a way to be able to just be on stage because when I'm just being and just in that moment Mm -hmm. that's when I'm like the funniest when I'm when my mind's trying to like uh Mm -hmm. 
um, when my mind's trying to control the situation too much and trying to be like, oh, they're not going to like this joke or Ooh, what's going on over there when my mind's too much like that. I'm not in the moment enough and mm -hmm. the audience can feel it, whether they're it's more they feel it subconsciously, but then they in like consciously, they're probably like, eh, I don't really like this guy that much. So mm -hmm. I think that's where that like spirituality of just like with comedy and laughter it's about like just letting go and being like that's why like laughter can be so important i think one of the things you just said in relation to you're the funniest when you just let go it's interesting so um you're from calgary i'm originally from winnipeg so let's just say it this way you started your life journey i started mine but probably on opposite ends of the spectrum like i was raised in a very christian very conservative home Mm -hmm. Now, I still am Christian, but I'm an inclusive, so I make room for, I just find my way uh, to the story of God through maybe Jesus and love and action like that to be there. But what's interesting is in our home, there wasn't a whole lot of laughter. And so there's a lot of seriousness. And my dad is a pastor of a mega church, and um, so thousands of members, and he was the head, so the bishop of this organization. And so uh, there was a lot in our home taught to us on what we should think not necessarily how to think but what to think so it's the orthodoxy it's like passing along the baton and being perhaps less about asking questions and more about here are the answers and here's mm -hmm. the stability if you find it through answers and there you are on the other side <laughs> well just a province or two over from where i grew up <laughs> and you're yeah. like so you have this atheist you go to college and you know this atheism way of being but you and i we both found our home back at laughter Mm -hmm. You you and I, we're both funniest or we're both mo most in our element, and meaning we both enjoy ourselves most, I think. Tell me if I'm wrong here. I'm willing to be wrong anywhere. But I enjoy myself most when I just let it flow. I'm not trying to be funny. I just vibe and go with it and don't take, like you say, things too seriously. Would you agree that you enjoy your life most when you just let in? And then you're almost surprised that the audience thinks it is that funny, but you're actually cracking up inside because you just pulled one on yourself. Like, is that how yeah. you feel? Right? No, a hundred percent. That's uh, I think, yeah, that feeling is the best anytime, right? Like it, it's always good. And honestly, I come from a, like, I come from a Muslim background and like, I think uh, my family was like a little bit strict too. Not like, uh, I wouldn't say like, as strict as yours because I remember hearing about your uh your background and like yours seemed like a lot more orthodoxy than uh mm -hmm. my uh, family like my family was a little bit uh less rigid but mm -hmm. you know there's mm -hmm. still like a Muslim family and my dad was still like a really strict parent and everything mm -hmm. but like one of the reasons I found laughter so powerful is like my dad was always so strict and so like kind of like you know he was just kind of like uh, emotionalist because like he was like the father that has to raise the kids and run the mm -hmm. business that's mm -hmm. kind of his mindset mm -hmm. but like I remember we used to like watch Chris Rock specials together when I was like in grade <laughs> seven and like you know I'm like a young kid and we're watching these specials which like he's you know Chris Rock is like um can be pretty dirty right <laughs> and like pretty like I like but that was a time where me and him would just laugh our asses wow. off and like I remember just like seeing him like the way he laughed at Chris mm. Rock and that gave me like uh that really just opened me to like going like wow like look at how powerful this is just seeing like my dad's personality completely change Wow. just because like Chris Rock is just uh saying some hilarious stuff and like that really like made me understand like how powerful this uh this medium is and uh I think was a big reason I came <laughs> to become a comic that is so fun you draw me to two short little stories that I'll just share here yeah I'll never, please. yeah I'll never forget so thanks for sharing by the way I'll never forget I was 18 years old and uh I was raised on the farm, but I wasn't able to work amongst dust because I developed allergies. So of course, farm life wasn't for me. And so I took on a, a position driving truck. And uh, I think I was probably 19 or 19 and a half, whatever it was. And I asked my dad if he'd want to come with me. And so my dad's church organization was in Southern Manitoba. And what I had observed from my dad in the past was anytime we went on a vacation, which was few and far between, because there's always work to be done on the farm and church to serve. But when we did, and we were very grateful that we could, 
you know, work on the farm. Plus also travel was kind of fun every now and a bit. And we didn't do much of it, but I never forget, we crossed from the Canadian into the U S side. And again, the, my church, my dad's church organization, it stopped at the Canadian border. And as soon as we crossed into the States, we were driving and all of a sudden my dad was laughing at things that he'd never laugh at before. And I remember for the first time in my life, realizing this is really who my dad was. And my friend, I could cry right now because I'm like, it was just the most beautiful. And you know, honestly, we spent three or four hours driving into the States and four hours back. It was about eight hours of complete bliss for me. I'm like, here was someone like your dad. He took life quite seriously. He was the provider. He was a servant. He was a husband. You know, he was a father. He had all these roles, but all of a sudden he could release. And it's a little bit like when I think, so the second story goes a bit like, I'll never forget three years ago before COVID, we were in Phoenix and we went to a comedy show. And while I was sitting there and listeners think about this, when's the last time you've seen a set and you're observing the comic and you're going, oh shit, this feels so cool that this individual said that. I can't believe the comic just, the guy on stage, did he just say that? And we're all laughing. So it's like this release. And maybe it's a surrender to the anxiety that we actually feel about much of life. We can finally have an outlet. And so when I observe that in my dad, that he had this outlet, I'm like, you know what? I could see what my dad really desired. It wasn't what he demanded in my life to be serious and what and how, or sorry, and what to think and getting it all correct. It was about mm -hmm. connecting to the greater what's in here and really at a base note to get out, get out. And it's not just the anxiety, but it's like get out so that we can maybe get into that place of mystery and be okay with just laughing at something. What do you think about that when you think about, and, and you know, you said earlier, enjoy your uncertainty. I want to dig a little deeper there because at the pinnacle of the enjoyment of life, lies to the exact degree that you can enjoy your uncertainties is how you will enjoy life talk to me a bit about surrendering to the anxiety perhaps is, is laughter that and not to bring too much specific meaning to but is laughter actually letting go of some anxiety and also enjoying your uncertainty laughter what do you think is it and how has it served you in some very interesting ways yeah, well, like, honestly, man, uh, like, the reason, like, uncertainty, we hate it so much, like I was saying this whole time, like, our minds always want control, and, like, they want certainty, <laughs> you want to, like, you know, that's the reason, like, we love as a society to be, like, you go four years of school, and then you do this, and then you're, uh, you're into a, a career, and, like, everything's going to be good, you're going to buy your house, it's, like, it's a roadmap that everyone can follow and then your mind feels at ease like okay this is uh mm. this is what we do and this is how the process goes mm. so like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the truth is like that doesn't exist at like mm -hmm. you might it might like uh it might feel like it exists like for some people they follow that roadmap and like for a long time it feels like it exists but eventually it's going to come crumbling down and for me like i've coming as a comedian like I took I didn't take that path so like as a comedian there's no certainty ever like I mm. like uh beautiful I have to I have to get good at this and like I have to be good enough to make a career out of this and like uh I have to be always keep be good to continue to get opportunities and shit so like if I didn't if I wasn't, uh, yeah, if I wasn't able to become comfortable in that certainty, I would have never last long because then your mind just starts choosing, um, choosing decisions based on fear. Mm -hmm. Like you're just going to mm -hmm. start doing a lot of fear based things because mm -hmm. once like, when you get into that point where you're in a place of uncertainty, you'll have that choice. Are you going to go towards fear? Because fear is going to tell you to make the decisions that are easier, that our culture says that this is what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And like, 
I went through that crossroads before, like years ago, I like when I was not a very good comic because it takes a while to develop as a comedian. Mm. I went through those crossroads of like, should I keep doing this or I can just go back to school and get a good job or go and do this as a job because I can make money and like, I'll just be fine and I won't have to worry. So it's like, that was my fear based mind saying like, just do this and you'll be fine. And then comedy well, can just be off follow the roadmap because four years of school will guarantee you a career and you're going actually that's horseshit it's a yeah and like uh i think jim carrey said that too it's like when you, like you can play it safe and then you can fail at that too and then like you know like why like you know what i'm saying like like at least if you're gonna fail at something fail at what you want and like um but that's like the whole thing about uncertainty like that's uh that was that's with my career but like mm. a year and a half ago my dad had like a major stroke and um he's still in the like long-term care and stuff oh, sorry, and that brother. was probably the biggest like he's starting yeah. to do better so like everything's mm. looking good right now but like at that point he was in a coma for a few weeks he freaking when he came out he was mm. paralyzed on his left side of the body um we had our old like uh family businesses which she was always running that I had to came back and like kind of like like help like get running again without him and everything and it's just like wow. that was like the biggest uncertainty I've ever felt in my life and it, it was extremely overwhelming wow. but I did like to kind of get I did have to find a way to get back into that uh into that understanding of like I'm not sure how this is going to end I'm not sure where this is going to go, but I have to find mm. a way to feel comfortable in this uncertainty mm. and understand that we'll get through this and kind of have that faith of like something greater will help me to get through this. Mm. And that like really did, like it really did help. Like, um, and we did get through it and like our family is so much stronger because of it. Mm. And, and like, uh, I know at that at those points, like at like if I wanted to get stuck into that fear-based mind, I would mm -hmm. have like really started getting a lot angry because I do have like anger in me. I do feel it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And at those points, I know all that anger and I start mm -hmm. snapping a lot. And I just like because I just get too overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. But when I'm ever able to be like, hey, I understand this situation is too much, but you know. Like we'll get through this and I don't know where the future is, but the future will show us what it is eventually. Mm. Like when you get into that mindset and being like more comfortable in the uncertainty, like I have more control over my emotions and I'm able to be like a more of a rock for my like little brother and for my mm. mom and everything. And I think that's kind of like what I'm saying with like uncertainty, like you have to under, like understand that it's like that's the life you tomorrow is not certain i'll tell you that much <laughs> and you know that from a very visceral real experience every time you enter stage and you hit set you're not going to control the audience if anything you're going to have to focus on what you have control over and that is to enjoy your presence and enjoy what's flowing through you and enjoy the neuro associations and the connections you're making and trust that perhaps the audience whatever you're reading whether it's correct or not, you're just going to go with it and play with it and let your experience talk to you and outcomes from you. And I'm sure a lot of what you're doing is scripted, but still you got to read the audience and you got to bring like, what's relevant in real time. If you don't, my friend, you lost them. You absolutely yeah. lost them. So to the point on no certainty ever think about COVID and though I don't want to talk about COVID because it's, it's, I think it's, you know, said and done pretty much is something we're going to have to learn to live with. I wish we'd realized that a little sooner, but anyway, mm. you know, who isn't and who wasn't struggling to um, shore up all their certainties. I felt like were taken away. And, you know, honestly, of course we have empathy for this emotion in the environment. I couldn't help but resonate also with this is what happens if apparently, like you say, we have this formula that we believe if we follow, then we will be able to control the outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of cute because ever try to control the outcome, my friend, you're in for whoop ass. It ain't going to yeah, happen yeah. because there's an element that you have control over and that's what you bring, but you can't 
control the other person. So whether you're applying at Google or Apple or any other company, you can't control another human. It's like when you do the set, you can't control people in the audience. You can only just bring what you got in here. So here's, here's the play. I want to take it back to the story. And by the way, my dad had a stroke about two years as well. And, and, uh, it's a little different than your father. Um, he was, he regained his ability to walk and talk, but the right side a little weaker, but sorry to hear about your dad, by the way, because that's tough, brother. Mm -hmm. I totally hear you. What's fascinating is this. Oftentimes, gosh, isn't it interesting how we reckon we choose a career, you being a comic, for the reasons many in the present moment. And then all of a sudden something comes along that life has, let's be honest, a lot of anxiety about. Like, how do we do this thing where we thought it was going to go one way and it didn't turn out like that. And when it ends up being a human being and health and life and death coming into the final life and death coming into the equation, all of a sudden you reckon that what you have been working with, like you say, no certainty ever. You enter the room, you see your dad, your family's around and there you are and you're able to show up when it matters most. Now, don't get me wrong. You can never be prepared ultimately for a moment like this. But when you build inner musculature, and you realize that it doesn't help for me to control somebody across the finish line. My question is this. When you said it helped to lean into a spiritual presence, how specifically did it help without you having need of a God that you could control towards your preferred outcome? Because what I hear you say today isn't that you have a spiritual leaning because it worked out for you, that's why. You're saying, actually, it helped me, and my dad is still going through this. A beautiful story. You're not trying to control the outcome by saying God is good if he does what I want him to do. Yeah, yeah. Or how do you do this? Or how did you do that? I, I like, yeah, I don't know. I don't think it's the, uh, I don't know how I did it. I think it's more of like the faith of it. I think I have faith that that's how it works. Like, uh, I don't know if you like, if you ever read Eastern philosophy, which is like a lot of what my belief system is based on, because I used to read that all the time in my early twenties. Um, oh, what is Eastern philosophy? Sorry. You know, the Tao, Zen, mm -hmm. Buddhism, Hinduism, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. and like how we were talking about uh, duality, like good and bad, mm -hmm. like their whole philosophy is about non-duality about like your mind always wants to make something a duality like mm. back and front good and bad like it because mm. that you know that's how it makes uh, allows us to label and conceptualize stuff mm -hmm. so their philosophy is always about like there's a non-duality there's no such thing as a duality like it's to, that and that allows you to kind of become in more in the present when you train your mind in that way mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. like a lot of that what they say you know a lot of what they say is like you never have to like uh like nature does everything on its own like that's how they would say it. it's like nature will take care of everything itself beautiful and like you know and like that's why they say like even if you look at a lot of our big like environmental disasters in the world like sometimes the way we make it worse is when humans try to go in there and fix it themselves and you just make it worse it's just like no like nature will heal itself like the best thing you can do is just step back and let it be mm. and like that's kind of like the philosophy I think I really do have faith in that philosophy that I understand mm. like mm. you just have to sometimes step back and let it be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's fascinating I'm listening to an audiobook at present and it's an audiobook about these two ladies who um, in Iran, uh, of course, Islamic, right? Mm -hmm. And so they were uh, not allowed to spread their faith. And so these two ladies converted to Christianity. And of course, it's not allowed. If you convert, you're not supposed to convert to Christianity. And, and they're mm -hmm. handing out Bibles to the people. And one of the things, and you and I are very similar on this, right? One of the things that's fascinating is there's this, like you were teeing up for the audience here. There's this, which one's good, which one's bad, this tension. Uh, yay or nay, I have to decide either which one. I'm not sure because it seems like, how could, 
the question I think often is how can we coexist and let everything belong? So in this audiobook, these girls are thrown into prison and I'm about halfway through, but they're persecuted basically for their faith. And one of the things that I often think about is, is how can we utilize um, universal truths to help us connect instead of perspective truths? For example, in the Islamic, apparently in the Quran, um, Jesus, Christianity is no problem about it because they, they actually believe Jesus was a prophet, but just another yeah. prophet, right? So they yeah, believe, yeah. but um, Jesus was a prophet of love and peace, and they have other prophets for other things. So he was just another prophet. And what's fascinating is on this whole play of tying together, here you are, you were raised in an Islamic home. I was raised in a very conservative Christian home. And you and I, we together find ourselves. Honestly, I don't know about you, but I really enjoy talking with you. Like, I just love your soul, my friend. You're just like a beautiful human. And there's something about that connects us. It isn't our faith from the past, but we've come together. Perhaps love is laughter. When we can just let into and be less serious about all things. Talk to me about when you think about a universal truth, universal truth in relation to how is it that faiths and non, I'm not talking about dogma faiths, I'm not talking about orthodoxy, but how is it that faiths actually all serve one another towards something beautiful? How could this be? Because you and I found this resting place without conflict. The book I'm listening to talks about there's one good and one bad, and they're fighting for that scenario. And I'm going duality. It just sounds so boring to me. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I like I do think like a lot of faiths. Like if you do read their like, uh, you know, I think if you do read like a lot of different faiths, you're gonna see like they all kind of point to the universal truths as like you know, and we can call it love, God. You know, I, I like, I always kind of see like, uh, whatever the, I don't like to call it God myself. I kind of see like, whatever that universal truth is, it mm. starts with experience. Like, mm. and like, that's why I love like when like the spiritual notions of like presence, because I love that mm. as like a way better way to look mm. at, uh, a universal truth, because like anytime mm. you feel present and, uh, your whole world opens up mm -hmm. and like you become a like and like you know I, i've been meditating for 15 years now and i've had like very like deep meditations where you just your whole mind kind of opens up and you feel connected to everything and then like I, i've been like experimenting with like uh ayahuasca which is like a plant medicine psychedelic kind of thing like once a year for the last quite a few years and that's also another thing that like allows you to feel like deep presence and like feel that deep connection with like everything and like I find like that in itself is a universal truth of just like but it starts with experience I can't conceptualize that I can't give you a word that's why people say god people say love people say whatever presence uh mm -hmm. which is the word i prefer to use um mm -hmm. like yeah people say all of those things but uh you know you did like you're never going to be able to put a word on it and that's why like all these religions kind of come at it from a different uh angle like uh if you listen like the dalai lama says though mm -hmm. you should have uh there's the good you should have like a spiritual language mm. and that's why like uh if you're raised christian or muslim sometimes it's good to go to your own faith because that spiritual language you'll probably resonate with a lot more because you know you're just you grew up in that culture you grew up with that family you grew up like around that stuff so that language might resonate you resonate with you more and take you to the place where you need to be and uh so i i yeah like when it comes to different faiths i think like our cultures and our people everything's so different like and there's so much variety i think like having that own spiritual language that resonates with you is really good and like for me i grew up like i you know i grew up muslim and like i have so much respect for my uh faith and like uh for my like that religion and stuff mm -hmm. like it 
but at the same time, I don't think that language was what really did it for me. And for some reason, going and finding um, Eastern philosophy in my early 20s, that really resonated with me. And I could like really understand what they were saying when I was reading those texts and like, yeah, finding a spiritual language can be really helpful Mm -hmm. and like stick Mm -hmm. into a kind of like a little bit of a path in that way can be really helpful. Like I was talking with a guy on my podcast a little while ago Mm -hmm. and he, he came from a Jewish family and uh, he kind of left it in the same way. Like a lot of us do when we leave, we kind of like, you know, become a lot more atheistic when we become adults and stuff. Mm -hmm. But then he like became spiritual and then came back into it. And then he just like noticed, like going back into that Judaism, he was just like, okay, like I really resonate with these stories and how it's communicated because this is how I was raised. And like, now I can really see these stories in a deeper light. And it really kind of takes me back into, uh, it takes me back to that experience. You want like, that's universal truth. And like, yeah like i i really think that universal truth is in that experience so it's like mm-hmm. it doesn't matter what you say or what you because like you're never conceptualizing it mm-hmm. it's just like mm-hmm. once you have that experience that experience is transformative mm-hmm. you will hit mm-hmm. that experience Love and it. because of that you're never going to be the same well, right yeah that's spot on yeah you can't mm, beliefs who says it? Somebody in the somebody in the current world they say uh, beliefs are a poor excuse for an experience, right? Yeah. So when it, yeah. once you have, once you have an experience, you don't have to defend it. You don't even have to debate it. If, so, if you share an experience, somebody goes, "It didn't happen." You're like, "Well, what am I going to say to that?" Like, I don't know what to say. Like, it just happened for me. So you know, and and, and, and to, to that point, what's fascinating, um, and just drawing upon a few things that you brought to the surface, isn't it interesting that spiritual language when we choose to we can let it connect us to other faiths i think that's the purpose and when you say dalai lama uh, you know there's many brilliant writings the buddhist tradition you know the Tao Mm -hmm. Te Ching. there's there's so many like i've studied some of this and i think it's just and i know when you and i first connected you're like it sounds like you've got a lot of eastern um faith in you and i'm like well the thing is well you know uh jesus (laughs) was from the East to begin with. And so Western Christianity is kind of bizarre. You know, we've kind of, you've kind of butchered this whole thing. You know what I mean? Like he, he was an Eastern person, (laughs) right? And so to the point on spiritual language, we can use it to connect us or disconnect us. We get to decide. And I think sometimes, so if I say that God is real for me because of Jesus, and you say, well, God is real for me, God, I just call it presence. And the next person says, I call it universal truth. The next person says, I call it experience. It's fascinating because anytime we have a label and we say, this is what is going to help us experience it for ourselves and have a real time experience. Yet then when we are with other people and that becomes the disconnecting factor, that's a choice we made. We made the choice to say God is real because I say God, or you say experience, or the next person says presence, or the next person says universal truth. I think faith is really shallow when I change my language. So let's say I say, back to your point, let's say God now just turns into the name presence. It actually shows a very undeveloped faith. And I, if I'm feeling so threatened that I cannot take on other ways of saying it to the point on They say in the Hebrew text, for example, God, God is actually a bunch of syllables or vowels or whatever, but you can't even say it. It's not, you know, it's not a word. Mm -hmm. So if you try to, it's already gone. So I, you know, I love your, your perspective where you drill into and you're like, actually, what is it for you? And, And so the question becomes, how could we allow what it is for the other person not to activate a threat response in us? So that we think we have to convert those people because they're not safe over there. Right? Mm. How can we do that? I think that's that that's what I'm always interested in. Go ahead. Well, like like you said, like I think when once you have that experience, like I or when once you start having that experience, because there's like levels of like having more of an, a spiritual or mystical experience, but like once you start having that, 
you become more understanding of what it is mm. that you stop like pushing it. Like I'll tell you when I first started getting into like these kind of texts, I was always like talking with people and like being like, oh, this is how you meditate. This is blah, blah, blah. This is, you know, but that's because I never had any of those experiences. So like in my head, I was just so excited to share this knowledge, but I was pretending like I knew all this crap, but I didn't know it. Like I, I never really, you know, I, I was, you know, and like, I, I think, uh, I think when people are like so kind of pushing it on you, it's either it's either coming from being an amateur, like you're not really, mm -hmm. you're just kind of like starting it and you're just excited. Mm -hmm. It's coming from that <laughs> or it's coming from insecurity where you're, mm -hmm. you're you don't really, mm -hmm. you, you're not really secure in your beliefs. So mm -hmm. that makes you push back at it or it makes you kind of, sometimes it makes people more dogmatic and like, uh, either angry or pushy or whatever that is so like I think once you have more spiritual experiences where you start feeling connected to something bigger than you um hmm. then like hmm. it creates a little bit of humbleness and a little bit of understanding of like hmm. okay like this is just something people have to experience on their own and like I can't yeah you don't want to be pushing hmm. it on people because you know, and like, I, I think they always say, like, no one's going to get there until they're ready to receive it. So it's like, mm -hmm. don't be pushing it on people. Like when somebody's ready to receive that experience mm -hmm. or ready to be there, they'll come to you and like, you'll know when you're like, okay, it's time for me to kind of give this person some advice because they're ready. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, mm -hmm. you'll know that that like, yeah, you'll know that right away. Because, because you can it. feel it. Yeah, yeah, you yeah sense exactly. It. I yeah. love this. I love it so much. <laughs> you say when you have an, a, a spiritual experience that's bigger than you, there's something that comes into your world, which is humbleness. <laughs> that to me is just so amazing because like any face, we can, we can be so restless and anxious that apparently they're not safe. So we must convert them to ours. When in essence, yeah. maybe they got something to teach us. Maybe it's all a beautiful play. When I think all a beautiful play, like, I do think sometimes you can have extremism everywhere. So this isn't just, you know, it's like politics too, right? Everywhere. You can have extreme Christians that aren't very helpful. They're not really connected. They're not making the world better. And so they're like, you must be out so we can be in. Like it's, it's total scarcity, right? Mm -hmm. I got a question for you. When you think about, and you, and you described it like this, and I hear this um, often where people say, I went through a season of my life where I was atheistic. And sometimes the world flinches and they're like, oh, and they just jump. You're like, you're an atheist. You mean you didn't believe. And then they, they throw stuff at you like, well, there's no atheist in a foxhole. And you're going, well, just hang on a second. My question is this. When I think atheism, I just think what you're doing is you're questioning a lot of things. You're doubting. And they say mm. in order to build faith, you have to have doubts. If somebody doesn't have doubts and questions, they can't build faith. So mm. to me, faith isn't a place uh of arrival to me it's a constant like journey so to some degree yeah, i'm always great. wondering to some degree i'm always kind of in that stance but when you think about how did your atheism quote unquote stage how did it actually help you to strengthen your current faith when you think about when you went to see your dad all of that time when you're questioning 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 and you're doubting 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 and now here you are your dad's there or take a different uh, you know approach or different story share go ahead well like i when like during my atheistic uh phase that was more like when i was in college and uh, i think i got through that just by looking at like because i was like when i was raised muslim i always went to muslim um like community gatherings and stuff mm -hmm. all the time so like i was always part of the community because our family was mm -hmm. but like i the one thing i always didn't like about it is like uh you know i remember like there was always one thing that stuck out to me once was like i remember seeing like a guy uh like who was probably going through some crap in his life and uh you know i my dad was talking to him just trying to like you know cheer him up a little bit but i remember he was just kind of like you know like just kind of the whole time he was just kind of like oh it's just this is god's will this is god's will and like as a kid i remember like looking at that and just being like <laughs> 
like dude you like stop blaming it like you have to make your like some decisions so that was my mindset back then as a kid mm-hmm. and I remember kind of thinking about that like oh like you're yeah. gonna go into religion and then that just makes you accept your suffering or something like that mm-hmm. so that was kind of my mindset back then so I kind of saw like religion as just a way to like keep people you know comfortable not, maybe in their suffering. yeah and like people not taking like uh not taking uh like a responsibility of their own act. yeah responsibility yeah. that's the word i'm looking for yeah so that was kind of my mindset back then and uh mm-hmm. then i went into sciences so like in sciences like everybody has like more of an atheistic thing so i started listening to guys like richard dawkins christopher hitchens sam harris like these like really atheistic people back then so like they always attack religious dogma and like I still understand that like when I look at religious dogma it's not good at all but like uh that was my whole thing oh religious dogma so you must uh when I was kind of attacking that I was just or when they were attacking that I just kind of was just like okay like just because religious dogma is bad that must be all of that's kind of bad so for a a while I thought I kind of thought like that um and that was also the time I started getting into like meditation and then Eastern philosophy. But I kind of saw mm. Eastern philosophy as something that like you didn't need mm. like religious belief or anything in. But, you know, those things started like slowly changing. And I think uh, once I started getting like deeper into meditation and once I started trying a little bit of psychedelics, that's when I started going like, mm. no, 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 like there's mm. something mm. greater and then that's mm. when I started wow. kind of like coming back to the faith like uh and understanding how important faith is like it, it like it really is important brother that's just beautiful I just love it you just light me up here you know when you say God's will like one of the things that my parents do to this day and even on our wedding uh, invitation to friends Meg and I've been married for just to let you know uh, 22 years been together for 27 on our nice. wedding invitation my parents they funded our wedding but on the invitation um, and I forgot we were kind of drafting how we wanted it written and we submitted it to we were you know our parents are paying the bill and so we we put it on the table and my parents go oh no no you forgot something we're like what is that well the, at the end they said or at the beginning it says the wedding will happen on July 9th 2000 and then we just went on with our spiel but they said, oh, no, no, you have to put in there, um, the wedding will happen on this day, Lord willing, comma, it was always Lord willing, which I think was kind of interesting. To be honest, it does take me, like you say, to a place of being, I don't have control over whether it happens or not, ultimately. But here's the thing, like you, I think it's like, we wrestle with the tension of how would I reconcile that with the source of what we know we're all made from and of, which is love. A loving God would have it that our plans wouldn't happen. And when you're younger, you're like, how the shit does that happen? Yeah. <laughs> and what kind of loving God is this? You know, so when I when I connect that for you, and I think about faith, what is faith? And I'm just taking notes as you're talking, because I like to develop my thinking and, and, and just learn from you. But it seems to me that you chose a path where faith, you didn't want it just to be relief. You wanted it to lead you to responsibility. There's something that I can do about it. Now, I don't want to control myself to the finish line. That's not the kind of responsibility you're talking about. You're saying, hey, listen, if I see that there's nothing I can do, and for example, like this earth isn't my home, you start going, so why the fuck am I here? Mm -hmm. Why the heck am I here? So you're beginning to, so relief is like, take everything and there's nothing we can do about this and just lay this, um, lay this offering and there's nothing I can do. And yet you're going... Actually, I want to, you know, I want to create presence. God created me to co-create with it. There's all this regenerative life force. I want to participate with that. I want to be responsible. So it's interesting. You're one of these participants. It's like, what does any church want? They don't want people just sitting there doing nothing, sitting in the pews, whatever they are on their knees and looking for relief. It's some comfort seeking. They want to say, hey, listen, are you guys willing to participate? right? Are you willing to be there? Yeah, dude, I love that. That was really well said. Uh, man, like, uh, like, I love that the regenerative energy of the world, like the, that, that natural regenerative energy of what, like, what's this universe or whatever, the God, whatever you want to call it, like, it's true. Like, like I was saying earlier, like, 
everything in nature does it by itself. Mm -hmm. Like once you get that idea in your head, mm -hmm. it makes everything easier. It's even like with creativity, like I try to write comedy every single day. Mm -hmm. And before I kind of got changed my mindset of what I was doing, it was just me going and being like, okay, I got to sit down and write jokes. And like, and like in my head, it was just like, you got to kind of keep pushing, use your willpower to keep pushing and write jokes. But it's like, once I got that idea of like everything in nature helps or happens by itself mm -hmm. or like, well, mm -hmm. it like does it by itself. And that whole regenerative creative mm -hmm. energy of the world. Mm -hmm. Once it was like more like, oh no, that energy mm -hmm. is there. Like my job is to allow that energy to flow mm -hmm. through me. Mm -hmm. Then it it really took away a lot of that like tension of like having to use my willpower to sit down and write every single day that tension kind of went away because it was more of just like no be with that creative energy and allow it to flow with you mm. and understand like you know it, and it gives you it makes you humble too because like now when I write a killer joke and I'm like god damn like that's such a good joke I'm more grateful to like I'm grateful because I'm like, oh, that like some sort of creative energy kind of came through me mm. and like generated mm -hmm. this beautiful joke. Like mm -hmm. now I have more gratefulness and humbleness because I'm not being mm. like an ego, egoist and like, being mm. like, oh, I created that joke. That's me. I kind mm. of understand that there's something deeper to that. So it's a, yeah. Wow. Really, yeah. Wow, dude. Hey, you could be like the comedic preacher. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> no it's so good like seriously brother you're just yeah you're just throwing it down right the regenerative energy um you know it's so fascinating you talk about willpower and i got this thing about willpower which is if you ever want to if you're in a boardroom and if you're presenting and if you wanted to close a deal and people are bringing willpower all you gotta do is just be in the room for a period of time and their energy will expedite. It's going to be done. <laughs> willpower exhausts eventually. Mm -hmm. So when I think about willpower, will, willpower always goes, why so? Why so? Why so? Nothing wrong with the why, but if it's like, why, why, why? And it's like always contemplating, well, how is God good? Or how is presence good? Or, oh, and it's just this constant, like trying to bring meaning. And what you're doing is you're going beyond, because we know there's something beyond giving meaning to things. Mm -hmm. It's just being with whatever is there, being present with it. The regenerative energy, you know, I think instead of saying, why so, we can be like faith says, why not? Why not? Because here's the thing, back to nature. I think in life, we do ourselves a whole bunch of favor if we harmonize with nature. If you look at, if you go into a forest, if a tree falls and it's laying beside this other tree and half on the tree, it doesn't seem like either one of them are complaining. It's just like moss grows on it and these bugs come and crawl and they start decomposing it. And so nature just harmonizes and it just goes by flow. And I think us humans, we seem to think that we're the wise ones. Like God created the heavens and the earth and then he created the human and then it was good. And we're like, hmm, that, that's really interesting because if I go into nature, why is it that nature seems so non-resistant to what is? But me as a human, I'm constantly trying to give meaning to this and that, all these things. Why not? Tree says, you fell on me. Okay, so I think nature loves us more than it loves more than it cares. It says, I love you so much, and it just goes and it just is. Right. And so, this place of harmonizing with nature, and if we think and connect that to laughter, listen, if there's something that's a little taboo, if it's a little sketch, we actually all want to have the feeling when my dad crossed the border and it's like, dude, he's been like choking this laughter down for way too long. And he crosses the line and he can start laughing. Or you, you're presenting this stuff. It's like you're a spiritual healer. Like the one thing that I like about you, you don't present yourself as like this mistake or anything like that. But I think to some degree, we all are about in, in through our profession, if we choose well, to let it be a spiritual healing mechanism. And I feel yeah. it off of you, Mike. I, I do. I do oh, because, thanks, yeah, for sure. Because I actually went online to YouTube and I watched one of your sets. And what's interesting is, um, like you said, laughter. And what what was your actual language? <laughs> Something about, oh, yeah, laughter is the sound of a soul or is the sound of the soul. Years ago, when I was young and I went to Christian youth, your youth pastor, I'll never forget. He said, if you've ever heard me sing, and I had, he can't sing. It was all over the place. 
He goes, you know, anybody can sing, a, a, you know, a song of praise to God or to the Lord, he said at the moment. And I thought, yeah, but with your audibles, my friend, that's kind of off. <laughs> the only thing he said, listen, singing is just making a sound. Mm -hmm. So it's like you doing a sound, but it's going beyond having to use words. Think about the relief. Like Sir Francis of Assisi said years ago, if words are necessary, use them. Mm. You create a felt experience and people laugh and they get something out. And you know what? That release of tension, you know, honestly, I think people crave relief often more than responsibility. But I think faith, you help them in that journey where you take them from, they feel relief, but guess what happens after you feel relief often? You're like, what now? You naturally tend to want to go more to being responsible with your life, right? What do you think? Oh, that's a, that's a great point, man. I, I agree with that a hundred percent. Um, the more like, uh, the more presence I get in my life and the more, uh, the, yeah, the more spiritual experiences and just like that kind of feeling I get in my life, I want to put more responsibility in my life. And like, yeah, I, I, a hundred percent, uh, I, I think you crave responsibility afterwards just because you feel that you're like, you you feel that responsibility is like helpful. Like you'll help the world with that a little bit too. I, I really a hundred percent agree with that completely. Yeah, I, I, I like, uh, I think like lately in my life, I've been finally getting to the point where I'm like, yeah, I really do want to find somebody and like start a family and everything like that. <laughs> and I think that's like a lot of my spiritual developments kind of led me to that, mm. that to that, like, and like even this last year and stuff, like just going through uh, like some like really big hardships and stuff and just mm -hmm. seeing how like I kind of handle it as a person, like, yeah, I, I feel like now I want bigger responsibilities and uh want to be responsible and i i, I know i Beautiful, can uh, handle that like so yeah yeah 100 percent. that's so good isn't it interesting how words are often the roadblocks of communication laughter mm -hmm. you laugh different than me but guess what it's not that if you use a word that i have to unpack how do you mean that word laughter is just laughter and that's mm -hmm. the beautiful thing and it connects us to difference and i just think Honestly, I, yeah, I, perhaps I'm saying I wouldn't mind trying a set every now and again, because I think it'd be kind of fun. You're a daring soul. And that would be the next level for me to actually do. I think in my life, I'd like to try at least one and just feel that that inner experience. You know, to be honest, um, for me, unfolding in real time in front of people has been one of my um, greatest fascinations. And I would say one of my deepest enjoyments, because I don't know what it is for you, but for me, what happens is I get to fully experience what's in me mm. and I get to see truly what's there, Freudian slips and all. And what's interesting it allows me to see clearly, not so I can necessarily judge or even focus on make better, but to be like, wow, that's in there. And that's how I think that's really cool. Cause once it's out there, it helps you nothing to be stuck there and look around Are people laughing. My friend, you got to keep going. If you get hooked there, it's over. The set's yeah, done yeah. and you're going to feel like, you know what, you're not going to feel too good. But to close this off, um, and here's a question that my audience really appreciates and I'll ask you, when it comes to your podcast, God, yay or nay, tell me, take this in any direction you want, but where within that do you struggle most? So that concept, where do you struggle most there? God, yay or nay? Ah, uh, I think it's uh, the name God. <laughs> that's like exactly, yeah. Wow. That and like, wow, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because like, like I said, uh, it's kind of funny when I stumbled on that name. I just thought it was kind of like, uh, mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, this is like a good name. I, mm -hmm. I like it. That has that duality in there, which is part of like my spirituality. Um, and then it has like that God thing, which I I really feel like. Uh, Mm. like as a society we, we struggle with you know I like a lot of the, you know like how they say like God is dead that whole like idea of just like our society just doesn't believe anymore mm. which like you know like there's some partial truth to that but like uh I in my experience I've always thought like no like when I talk to people there's so many people who have some faith in something bigger they just haven't explored it and that's why I kind of like, like mm. that name, God, yay or nay, because every mm. time I ask that to different people, 
all of a sudden they open up about what they believe in God. And like, mm -hmm. honestly, I, I have atheists on my show too, but even when they, I ask them and like all of a sudden they start talking about it, eventually like some, some of them even come back to like being like, well, I do believe in something more. And I think that, you know, and then like all of a sudden they, when they start talking, they kind of start uh, showing that they do believe in there, there's something more to this world. And like, they believe in kind of some spiritual ideas and stuff. So like, I, I don't know, I have the one that I've always struggled with that word God, but I, I, I like that struggle. I think that that's good. I, and I, I like asking people that question because it like, it allows them to explore what they mean by God, mm -hmm. because just, just with like asking, like having so many people on my podcast, most people aren't really religious uh, mm -hmm. uh, that I have on my podcast. They're more spiritual. Mm -hmm. So like, most of them don't believe in any kind of dogmatic way of like mm -hmm. God and like how it's like a hundred percent literally said in the mm -hmm. Bible or Quran or whatever mm -hmm. book they believe in more of these uh, in a spiritual way. And like, they kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's funny or it's fun watching them communicate it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think it's like a healthy thing for people to communicate. Well, I think it's courageous and helpful for you to navigate with your discomforts. If you feel uncomfortable using a certain word, I think it's, uh, you know, for example, in the, in, in the Christian tradition, in the Bible, it talks about, you know, God will remove anything that you make a God. If anything you make as a graven image, he'll remove from your life. And what people often, and Christians often don't contemplate, is if you make God your God, he'll remove it from you. So if you make God your God, which means to the exclusion of all the other people he's made, and you let God be the disconnecting, the word God be disconnecting to you, he's going to say, uh, 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 because the, the, the Christian tradition is full of ver verbatim in the Bible, for example, where it talks about God says, okay, you've heard it said. So think about your dad. You've heard it said. Um, you know, you should do the right thing. So you're observing your dad, the demand in your life is your dad's revealing, be responsible, do these things. But the child and we are the human, we always observe and follow desire more than demand. Mm -hmm. So the writing in the Christian tradition goes, you've heard it said, the laws are like this and this, but then it continues and it says, but I say unto you. And every time it's, but I say unto you, it's like love First, go love your enemy. Go love your brother that slapped you. Give him the jack, carry his load an extra mile. So it's like to that whole play, when you talk about God just ends up being, it sounds to me like what you decided there. It's a bit like me labeling my podcast weekly wins and losses. Honestly, do I necessarily think that we're losing in life or winning? You know, it's just a duality. So I chose words that society understands. So I think God really brings my friend. I love it. It brings so much rich dynamic there because people are like, what are you talking about? But then you go, God, yes or no. I love it. Good job. Awesome. Okay. So any, any final words of wisdom? Hey, do you want to share a joke? Do you want to, can I put you on the spot? Do you want to share a joke? What does that even mean? And you want to go on a bit of a riff? <laughs> uh, I'm not a riff. <laughs> I could probably share a joke. Uh, all right. Well, I'll tell you. I was uh, out with a friend the other day, and they were trying to convince me to quit sugar. Now, this is what they told me: sugar is ten times more addictive than cocaine. I'm like, that just makes me less afraid of cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> so good. That is so good. Thanks, brother. That's awesome. So, uh, newer, where can people find you? Where can people seek you out? Uh, like my website's newerkidwide.com. Um, but like, honestly, like Instagram's where I'm, uh, uh, most active on it's at newer kidwide, just my first and last name, just N O O R K I D W A I. And, uh, yeah, so if you're on Instagram, that's where I'm most uh, active on. And like, you'll see my tour dates, you'll see my comedy, you'll see a bunch of other stuff. And uh, my website has a bunch of that stuff too. And that's just newerkidwide.com. So those are probably the two best places. Love it, folks. So here you go. I'm just going to repeat back. You're going to want to go to N O O R K I D W A I.com, correct? Yes. Newer? Okay. Yes. And so hit them up on Instagram. Um, go to YouTube, watch something next to me comes into your area. Perhaps you want to request <laughs> that he come to uh, the comedy 
place that you normally like to attend that he comes. Yeah, yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Super fun. <laughs> Newer, it was my pleasure. Always is. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for having me, buddy. I really had a good time. I sincerely hope you enjoyed that little interplay. If you liked the podcast episode, let us know by subscribing, leaving a little review, and sharing with a friend as you feel appropriate. Honestly, the guests that I host on this show, they love the feedback, and I personally love knowing that you're listening. So whether you choose to work with me as a guide or not, and that's your guide or not, that's simply great. Why, you ask? Well, because you're obviously one of those that's listened to the very end of this podcast. You've clearly made a decision to invest in yourself, and honestly, how isn't that just the best news? So if you decide you need and or want to get unstuck by activating your creativity and your resources, if you want to see things clearly, if you want to get to your next level, if you want to live with vibrant energy and passion, simply go to www.jameshepner.com for one-on-one coaching and or go to www.weeklywinsandlosses.com for the no-charge Friday noon global community weekly wins and losses video call. So again, I thank you for investing in yourself. See you next time. My sincere hope is that you've gleaned a few nuggets for yourself and a few pieces of interest that help you move forward in your unique journey. So again, I thank you for joining me here. This is James Hefner clocking out. Until next time, peace out, rock up.